Before we get into today's episode, I just want to let you guys know about my second channel called Illuminati. It's linked in the description box. It's also linked in my Linktree link. If you don't know about it, make sure to go ahead and check it out. It's where I'm starting to live stream and talk about more relevant topics, recent things that are coming up, just anything going on in the news, the world. Sometimes it's a little more casual too, and just hanging out with all of you. If you want to check out the live streams or afterwards, I have an amazing editing team that goes ahead and edits those streams and puts them together into nice little digestible pieces make sure to check out that channel, Illuminati, T-E-A. Dino. It's not short for dinosaur, unfortunately, but it actually stands for Democrat in name only. Some argue the term is overused and ridiculous. We should want more centrists and moderate people in Washington. Others say that dinos like Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema hurt their own party by blocking important legislation. Are these supposed dinos just misunderstood centrists or are they corrupted and willing to sway over party lines if money leads them there? Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about two dinos, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema. put a massive disclaimer right here and say that while this script will get political to an extent, my intention here isn't to tell you how you should vote, which party is better or what to believe in. The purpose of this episode is to discuss the concerns surrounding potential corruption, that's it. And it does come from both sides. So with that being said, let's get into it. We'll begin by talking about the background of Mansion and Cinema. I won't discuss every aspect of their political careers at length, but I will give you a brief summary as to who they are if you haven't heard of either. Let's start with Joe Manchin from West Virginia. When he ran for governor in 1996, Manchin was against abortion for the death penalty and he had a campaign contribution from the coal industry. Weeks before the general election that year, Manchin sent 900 letters to top Democrats explaining that he wouldn't support the Democratic nominee at the time, Charlotte Pritt, because she wasn't interested in the concerns of moderate and conservative Democrats, according to him. Pritt was the daughter of a coal miner who had the enthusiastic backing of labor unions, according to Politico. But Manchin instead supported Cecil Underwood, the Republican candidate who came out on top. To this day, Pritt claims that Manchin has never been a real Democrat, though multiple other Democrats in the state made the same decision as Manchin. It seemed at that time that many Democrats in West Virginia were more middle of the road folks, according to the Charleston Gazette. They weren't inclined to lean that far left to begin with. By the time Manchin was the governor in 2005, he was a quote, tax cutting anti-abortion pro-gun Democrat. His tax policies earned him an A from the Libertarian Cato Institute, the sole Democrat to get that grade, end quote. In one of his earliest speeches, he also called himself a friend of coal and later highlighted his endorsement from the NRA, the National Rifle Association, while running for Senate. Years later in 2015, he campaigned for Hillary Clinton, but began supporting Trump after it became clear his state did not approve of Clinton and Bernie Sanders won West Virginia's Democratic primaries. Manchin faced criticism yet again when in January, 2017, Manchin skipped a meeting to discuss healthcare with President Obama and fellow Democrats because he couldn't in good conscience talk to only Democrats. He also claimed to have a lot in common with climate change denier Scott Pruitt, President Trump's selection for the Environmental Protection Agency. So the question here is why be a Democrat at all if so many of his decisions seem to lean towards the right? Well, according to Politico, Manchin, now 74 years old, is a Democrat because of tradition. In the 50s and 60s, many people in Farmington, West Virginia, where he grew up were actually Democrats. As a kid, Manchin believed that Republicans were rich, whereas he grew up in poverty. His grandfather, an immigrant from Italy who worked in the mines and organized unions, his grandmother who took in homeless people and gave them a place to stay, and his uncle, A. James Manchin, were all Democrats. A. James Manchin especially was a colorful politician who some say is the reason that late President John F. Kennedy won the primary in West Virginia in the first place. Franklin D. Roosevelt or FDR was also a Democrat before many working class and rural areas began to sway more towards the Republican side of things, political rights. The old FDR Democrats, they're not alive anymore, said Ted Boter, the executive director of the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. And subsequent generations didn't see the party working for them the way it did for their parents. Farmington has been losing population since the 50s. And in November, Marion County, a cradle of the candidacy of JFK, voted for Trump just as passionately as the rest of the state. Democrats at this point in a place like this are clinging to pieces of the past. 
So is Joe Manchin clinging to the past or is he simply the middle of the road? One attorney in West Virginia, Chris Reagan, claims that there's no future for his brand of Republican light, as is there a resurgence of Democrats in red states, and it needs to come from a party that articulates its views and doesn't have a sense of Me Tooism. Other articles have said that Democrats in name only are, in essence, just Republicans. However, Joe Manchin isn't actually alone in this. Kristen Sinema, Arizona's state senator, has also been branded as a dino label in the press. You might know her as the Senator that went viral almost a year ago when she gave a dramatic thumbs down to vote against including a $15 minimum wage in the coronavirus relief package. Though she claimed this policy had no business being in the relief package, others say she was voting against something her party is firmly behind as it's seen as being vital to America's working class. She also was widely criticized for the manner in which she gave the thumbs down, seemingly eager and quite excited to give it. Jacobin Magazine has claimed that Cinema, once a Green Party member and anti-war activist, went from being an earnest do-gooder to a monster in Washington. In an interview with PSN in 2009, she explains that she was a frustrated social worker who saw that there was no way for the family she worked with to realize their American dream. From there, she says that she started lobbying and running for office to do a better job helping underprivileged people and won, despite never having intended to be a politician in the first place. She's also very openly bisexual, meaning greater LGBTQ plus representation in Washington. Historically, she's advocated for raising the minimum wage, hence why her thumbs down surprised and upset so many people. According to Jacobin, it was the Washington swamp that had cinema changing her tune. This wasn't just a matter of cinema no longer being a Democrat, but she seemed to go against the core beliefs that even got her elected in the first place. She helped the financial industry roll back regulations and voted to help corporate lobbyists. Cinema even became one of the top recipients of campaign cash from predatory lenders. The website Open Secrets currently has her listed in their top 15 members of the house and estimates that she's received over $150,000 as of writing this. Other sources such as The Hill claim that Cinema is not a dino for this at all, but a strategic moderate looking for a way to defend her seat. Opinion contributor Neelan S. Shatervidi claims that moderates seldom represent truly moderate voters, but that they tend to represent hyper-polarized purple states such as Arizona. So while it's been implied that Manchin is no Democrat at all, some suggest that Cinema is actually a strategic policymaker that can't afford to alienate a Republican base. Now that you've got a rough idea of who Manchin and Cinema are, let's talk about one of the recent controversies that have landed them both directly in the spotlight, the Build Back Better plan. This bill has a $3.5 trillion price tag. However, many argue that it's well worth the cost as it's one of the most ambitious policy agendas since the Great Society of the 60s or the New Deal of the 30s. Biden's Build Back Better plan includes universal preschool for children, free community college, expanded Medicare services and Medicaid, lower prescription drug costs, 12 weeks of paid family leave, multiple policies regarding phasing out fossil fuels and more. And so much more in fact, that only 10% of Americans claim to actually know about the plan in any great detail and almost 30% claim they don't know what's in it at all. In October, Biden stated that he needed 50 votes in the Senate and Democrats to be united, but he had 48. Those two holdouts are, as you might expect, Manchin and Cinema. So let's start with Cinema's reaction to Build Back Better and then the position she's taken. Although Manchin has been a conservative Democrat for his entire career, Cinema hasn't and has therefore confounded her own party with some of these decisions. While that could be to avoid upsetting Republicans, as we mentioned earlier, sources allege that she may have done the opposite and lost the support of enough Democrats to endanger her reelection just the same. Many Democrat colleagues have in fact been extremely irritated at her non-committal nature, while some stating that they have no sense of what she wants from this bill. The chair of the House Budget Committee, John Yermuth, told reporters that, quote, I can't put myself in her head and I don't want to. In the light of this political pressure, some of the people closest to cinema quit working for her, including the oldest members of her advisory council. They called her an obstacle to progress and common defense. A progressive veteran activist group told her that they wanted answers to big donors rather than her own people. We shouldn't have to buy representation from you and your failure to stand by your people and see their urgent needs is alarming, they added. According to the New York Times, one of the members of her advisory council has been there since 2019, Sylvia Gonzalez Anderish, and stated that Democrats were desperately trying to help her win that seat. Now they question what it was all for. Nobody knows what she was thinking because she doesn't tell anybody anything. It's very sad to think that someone you worked for that hard to get elected is not even willing to listen. 
The fact that cinema was a holdout on such an important democratic piece of legislation felt like a betrayal for many. Those that had once campaigned for cinema demonstrated outside her offices in the summer of 2021. Some protesters said that it feels as if cinema simply doesn't care about her voters and they'll never vote for her again. They held up signs calling on cinema to end the filibuster and criticized her for holding a fundraiser with business lobbying groups that opposed tax hikes. Casey Klaus, 29, told the New York Times, I believed in what it would mean to have a queer representative who believed in the climate crisis. I knocked on doors for her. I was an intern for her campaign. I really believed. Miss Yearland charred her disappointment as well, adding, her cinema's vote matters so much. She seems like a Republican in Democrats clothing. As a brief aside here, let me explain what a filibuster is just briefly. In the Senate, it's an attempt to delay or block a vote on legislation or a confirmation. In this case, for legislation to not suffer death by filibuster, that means a party must be united. With Manchin and Cinema opposed to the Build Back Better plan, it means that they could derail the entire legislation. Why Cinema won't vote for Build Back Better in the first place, we can't be entirely sure as she's notoriously quiet. Some sources allege that she only talks about what she supports and doesn't after a bill is voted for. However, the Washington Post speculates that pharma front group spending $1.2 million to back cinema may actually have something to do with it and why she doesn't seem eager to impose tax hikes on the rich or lower the cost of prescriptions. Other sources such as The Guardian don't hold back any punches and come right out with accusing cinema of being a shill for big pharma, citing her old opinions about prescriptions and comparing it to her new ones after receiving their donations. For example, in 2019, Cinema told several stories of Arizonans who told her about their drug costs during a Senate hearing. She said in part, "'There's a gentleman in Mesa, Arizona who is lucky enough to be insured, but he has seen the price of his medication to treat a serious lung condition increase nearly five times in just one year. He's looked, but there are no generics available that could offer him any financial relief. A woman in Glendale, Arizona worries about her husband who has a serious heart condition but his medication costs more than $500 out of pocket for a three month supply. So he refuses to fill his prescription because he's worried about how it would impact their family financially. In February, 2020, Cinema stood firm by this, stating that she was pursuing policies to make sure that EpiPens, insulin, and other life-saving drugs were more affordable and available. However, by May, 2020, Cinema received $121,000 worth of campaign donations from Pax, a pharmaceutical company. According to Kaiser Health News at the time, she recently emerged as a pharma favorite in Congress and it began to show. In September, 2021, a group called Center Forward, which is heavily bankrolled by pharmaceutical research and manufacturers of America, bought $600,000 worth of advertisements promoting cinema. Days later, she told the White House she opposed the current prescription drug plan. One of the lead authors of the Medicare drug pricing bill, Kana, was offered to meet with her, but he claims that she's refused. Now, Cinema has opposed the Build Back Better plan for reasons that aren't entirely clear, yet it's clear she does have close ties to the pharmaceutical industry and has received hefty donations from groups that oppose the ideals within it. So it's quite understandable why some would feel that she's absolutely sold out. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that you should believe one way or another, but you shouldn't let money influence your decisions either. Politicians may not be able to live up to all of their campaign promises, but in this case, the reason why I found this one worth discussing is because people feel as if she hasn't just failed to keep her promises, but she's entirely abandoned her ideals. While cinema's reasoning tends to be unclear at times, multiple sources believe that the reason behind Manchin's lack of support for Build Back Better is a little more straightforward. Cole. Don't ask Joe Manchin where he got his money from. Bloomberg reporter Ari Natter learned that the hard way when he asked about the annual dividend checks Manchin collects from a coal company now run by his son. Natter pressed Manchin for answers about the millions he receives from Ener Systems in particular, but Manchin shut him down and asked, you got a problem? Soon followed by, you'd do best to change the subject. Whenever Manchin does answer questions about his wealth, he's consistently stated that his fortune is in a blind trust. However, the Philadelphia Inquirer argues that the Senator knows coal dollars are floating his boat and his corruption is the worst kind out there, the legal kind. It's a misnomer. These are not blind trusts whatsoever. Craig Holman, the Capitol Hill lobbyist on ethics and related matters for the good government group, Public Citizen told the Philadelphia Inquirer. He added that Manchin is one walking conflict of interest. Manchin's coal income is almost triple his Senate salary of $174,000 per year. However, Senate rules allow lawmakers to retain their investments and they don't require any sort of recusal unless it would affect their specific company. 
So in Manchin's case, that would be a federal contract with Enter Systems. Manchin can still vote on coal legislation despite his clear conflict of interest. And he can still vote on climate regulations despite his family's business being responsible for massive amounts of air pollution. They sell waste coal from abandoned mines to power plants that emit air pollution at a higher rate than any other plant in the state, according to the Washington Post. Plus, while the money may be in a so-called blind trust, that doesn't mean Manchin is unaware of it, and far from it, actually. Manchin actually signed a sworn statement saying he is aware of his earnings. He was paid $492,000 in interest, dividends, and other income from Enter Systems during 2020, and his share of the firm is somewhere between one to five million. Ethics experts have stated that if his coal interests are not in a blind trust, then Manchin's impartiality is called into question, especially considering that he wanted Biden to drop the part in Build Back Better that phased out coal plants. Now, just because the Build Back Better plan didn't call for Enter Systems specifically to be phased out, I don't think that means Manchin should have been allowed to have input on this matter or change the portions of the plan regarding coal. If I were in government or something, right, and I own a candle company, and then for some reason there was some candle bill on the table, obviously my personal opinion would be to make sure that the bill furthers the progress of allowing me to continue my candle company, which means decisions or opinions that I would have involved in that candle bill would be invalid because I have a clear bias, but that's apparently not the case in government. Don Fox, acting director of the Office of Government Ethics in the Obama administration, examined Manchin's financial records and stated that Manchin's efforts to dismiss questions about his coal interest by saying he has a blind trust is misleading and at worst, just not true. The question I would ask him would be when he says it's in a blind trust, well, your public financial disclosure report that you sign and swear is true does not have enter systems in the blind trust. And if the blind trust is truly blind, then how do you know what's in it, Fox said. An ethics expert at Public Citizen, Craig Holman, has also echoed these sentiments and called the situation a blatant conflict of interest. Unfortunately, this is not the first time these questions have arisen. Manchin backed legislation that gave plants a tax break in the mid 1990s as well. One of them just so happening to be an Enter Systems customer in Granttown, West Virginia. Local citizens complained, but Manchin argued that he avoided ethics dilemmas by giving the tax break to similar projects as well. Yet his policies have also hindered West Virginia as much as they've helped those at the plant. The clean electricity program intended to reward utilities for purchasing electricity from wind, solar, or other emissions-free sources and penalize those that don't. West Virginia, which consistently embraces coal power, has higher electricity costs as a result, five times more than the national average. Manchin could work to change this, but he hasn't. Instead, he claimed that the clean electricity plan was a waste as coal companies are already moving towards other energy sources. The only thing they want us to do is pay $150 billion for what's already happening, he said. Now, if that were the case, why not put new measures in place to ensure that everyone is already on board? One moment, Manchin called these methods unattainable. Then he says it's already happening. The way he continually tells reporters that they do best to change the subject, as he said it on numerous occasions when they bring up his coal company, certainly does not help his reasoning. As a matter of fact, coal miners themselves have actually spoken up in support of this plan with the largest coal mining union putting out a statement for Manchin to reconsider his stance on Build Back Better. We are disappointed that the bill will not pass, Cecil Roberts, president of the United Mine Workers of America said in a statement on Monday. We urge Senator Manchin to revisit his opposition to this legislation and work with his colleagues to pass something that will help keep coal miners working and have a meaningful impact on our members, their families, and their communities. And I just wanna state the obvious here, but it speaks volumes to me that coal miners themselves have asked Manchin to reconsider. Miners and the people within Manchin's own party are on the same page. It just seems like the higher ups at these plants and perhaps Manchin's wallet that are not. In regards to Build Back Better, both Cinema and Manchin have been praised by Republican billionaire donors for holding out. One billionaire donor, Stanley Hubbard, cut Cinema a check and stated that she and Manchin were two good people that the Democratic Party needed more of. On the other hand, Kyle Herring, president of Accountable US, a nonpartisan watchdog that targets government corruption, stated the following. What else but industry money could explain the manufactured excuses for resisting Build Back Better, considering it remains extremely popular, is fully paid for, and would cut cost and taxes for most everyday people in Arizona and West Virginia. Corporate interests and billionaires have done very well, even during the pandemic, and don't need more special treatment. Senator Cinema and Manchin have the chance they may not get again to help so many regular families and seniors get ahead for a change. So why squander it over complaints of a handful of rich interests that exploit tax loopholes and ship jobs overseas? The communications director of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington has said the same, money follows power. 
Since Mansion and Cinema are the deciding votes for major legislation, it's not surprising that this would be extremely profitable for them. And before we continue on to look at even more of their questionable ethics, let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. It's January, it's the new year. And you know what we want in 2022? We want delicious, healthy food that doesn't take forever and a half to make. In comes Daily Harvest, because Daily Harvest is one of the easiest ways to get more fruits and veggies in your stomach every day. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, flatbread, smoothies, and more, built on all organic fruits and vegetables right to your door, and it conveniently stays fresh in your freezer. Daily Harvest takes only a couple of minutes to prepare and never uses preservatives, added sugars, or artificial anything. So you get food that's good for you with minimal effort. I have daily harvest smoothies mainly as like this weird kind of like breakfast into lunch kind of snack kind of thing because I don't really do breakfast and I take one of their smoothies and it's literally the fruits when you open up the smoothie packet, it is fruits and veggies in there. It's not like some weird paste or anything. It is the actual fruits and veggies. Pour it into my blender, put in some oat milk, blend it up and voila, delicious tasty smoothies. Daily Harvest makes it easy to feel good about what you're doing for yourself and the planet. So make sure you go to dailyharvest.com slash casket to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash casket for up to $40 off your first box. Dailyharvest.com slash casket. And speaking about continuing to take care of the planet, did you know how much plastic your cleaning products use? Estimates say 5 billion plastic cleaning bottles are thrown away every single year. That's a lot of clean floors, but a lot of plastic added to the Pacific garbage patch. But with Blue Land's refill cleaning system, you can reduce your waste and your guilt. With Blue Land, you buy the bottle once and you refill it forever. Just fill their Instagrammable bottles with water, add a hand soap or a spray cleaner tablet, and you quickly will have powerful cleaners with great scents like lemon and lavender. And Blueland has something for every aspect of your home, from their best-selling clean essentials kit to their hand soap duo, laundry, dishwasher, and toilet tablets. I've been using their laundry tablets, by the way, and this is something that's important to me because I have sensitive skin, and their laundry tablets are scent-free, and they have not actually managed to irritate my skin. So if that's important to you as well, then Blueland has got the hookup. So right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash casket. That's 20% off your first order of any Blueland products at blueland.com slash casket, blueland.com slash casket. Though Manchin has had his ethics brought into question in regards to coal, Cinema has received donations from a business model we're all familiar with by now, MLMs. Multi-level marketing businesses have actually given Kristen Cinema thousands of dollars recently, and every single one of them is bad enough that they have their own episode of Multi-Level Mondays. Altacore, the parent entity of Amway, Isogenics, New Skin, USANA, Mary Kay, and Herbalife each gave Cinema $2,500. And yes, I'm very serious. I literally have an episode on every single one of those companies individually, except Altacore, which now is on my radar. Cinema was actually the only lawmaker that Isogenics and Newskin political action committees gave to in 2021, at least as of November 5th, 2021, when this article was written. The Direct Selling Association didn't offer much insight as to why this is, stating that contributions to candidates from DSA's political action committee are based on a variety of factors. Political remarks that Cinema's mother was a direct seller and the Pro-Union Pro Act protecting the rights to organize would make it harder to classify workers as independent contractors. The PRO Act has a lot of Democratic supporters, except for, as you guessed it, Kristen Cinema. There are two other Democrats that actually have yet to sign it, but both have already signaled their support, although Mark Kelly of Arizona just wants to see a few changes to it. MLMs, of course, are opposed to the PRO Act, considering how they rely on independent contractors to shill their products, paying them little to nothing in the process. Again, seriously, look at almost any Monday episode for Multi-Level Mondays, and it's the same story again and again and again. So of course, they do not want the PRO Act to pass. Cinema doesn't just accept financial support from the shady industry, but she's offered them her support as well. The DSA actually posted a release in May, 2020 that Kristen Cinema led a virtual town hall with Isogenics International. The pandemic was still in its early stages, as Kristen Cinema stated. The current situation provides an opportunity for businesses such as direct sellers who rely on close personal interactions to be creative. I'm here to help your business channel succeed through these difficult circumstances. It is extremely difficult for me to be unbiased here, and I'm just gonna be real upfront about that. My hatred for the predatory nature of MLMs is strong, and it is so upsetting and harmful to see a senator supporting these types of businesses. We've seen politicians support them before, so it's not as if this is surprising. But what irritates me the most is the numbers don't and have never supported these so-called business opportunity claims. 
There is no real opportunity for those being recruited. MLMs are in essence legal pyramid schemes. When lawmakers support them, citizens suffer and cinema should be ashamed of herself. As frustrating as this may be, Manchin's actions around the Freedom to Vote Act have been arguably even more upsetting for his party. To fully explain the situation, we need to address some of the actions taken by red states that have made voting harder. Florida, Georgia, Arizona, Iowa, Kansas, and Montana have passed incredibly restrictive laws in 2021. For example, Arizona passed a bill that would remove up to 200,000 voters from the state's permanent early voter rolls, which qualifies residents to automatically receive an absentee ballot. Voting experts anticipate that this disproportionately affects the Latino community and no Democrat in the Arizona State House or Senate voted for the final passage of that bill. In Montana, several bills restricted ballot access, requiring voters who lacked a government ID to submit two forms of identification to vote and another repealing the state's same day voter registration system. The Republican voter suppression agenda that was passed in Montana was completely one-sided, Democratic State Senator Bryce Bennett, the vice chair of the State Administration Committee said. We were never consulted. These bills were brought up out of their own caucus and we fought like hell to make sure they weren't passed, but the votes weren't there. In Iowa, one bill meant that early voting days were cut, poll hours were reduced on election day, and county election officials were stripped of authority. As you can imagine, this is likely to disproportionately affect those that can't afford to take time off of work and minimally affect wealthy white citizens. Democrats felt that they have been left out of these processes and exclusionary bills entirely. Some, like those in Georgia, were especially harsh, prohibiting food or drink distribution to voters waiting in line, which can be hours long, and making an 11 day cutoff to request absentee ballots before election day. Needless to say, Democrats took action. Originally called the For the People Act, this bill contained campaign finance provisions and a requirement that states establish nonpartisan redistricting commissions. However, Manchin said he wouldn't support the bill without massive changes, so change it they did. Over the summer of 2021, the new version Freedom to Vote was created. Manchin being a co-sponsor obviously supports the Freedom to Vote Act, but he doesn't really seem all that keen on passing it either. He told Democrats he needed time to build support from Republicans, all while refusing to go nuclear, insisting that the two thirds majority required is a protection of minority rights and an incentive for bipartisan consensus. Filibuster critics say the opposite. Manchin persuaded no one. He and Cinema have fiercely supported the filibuster, though this effectively leaves the Freedom to Vote Act dead in the water if they won't go nuclear. Democrats have been pushing Manchin to use the nuclear option and break this months long stalemate on voting rights legislation. But as of writing this, the situation is still unfolding and it's unclear what may happen next. The day after the script was written, an article from NPR was released that says senators may be taking up a talking filibuster that would give the minority action blocking on legislation or creating a carve out that would provide a path for Democrats to pass voting rights legislation with a simple majority. Again, we just have to wait and see. Also as an aside, the John Lewis Voting Act right is another completely though important set of voting legislation. Manchin has signed on and this bill would strengthen the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I just wanted to mention this because while I can't cover every bill or act Manchin has voted on, I wanted to make it clear that these are two separate pieces of voting legislation that are hotly debated right now. As for what all of this means for Manchin and Cinema, it's painted them in a questionable light to say the very least. The Guardian has claimed that their status as holdouts has been proven lucrative and they've been condemned by anti-corruption watchdogs. Some articles written before many of these controversies argue that lobbyists should be banned from political fundraising entirely as it distorts democracy. More than 40% of the 246 fundraisers that were able to raise more than $100,000 for George W. Bush's 2000 presidential campaign were eventually given a job or appointment in his administration. Sometimes it didn't even make sense. Like when Teal Bivens, a rancher and member of the Texas Senate was appointed to be a US ambassador to Sweden. It just didn't make any sense. One source argues that the solution is defining lobbyists broadly and making any lobbyist fundraising count towards their individual contribution limit. Reasonable expectations may be included, but generally speaking, candidates and political parties shouldn't accept lobbyist fundraising proceedings and a lobbyist should be properly defined. The New York Times also makes it a point to mention that IBM, a massively known and billion dollar company, doesn't donate to politicians. Their philosophy is not to use IBM time, money, or materials for political purposes. They've made no political action committee and they restrict their money from being funneled to candidates when giving money to trade groups. Yet this doesn't mean they don't have a seat at the White House. Current chief Arvind Krishna told the New York Times that he doesn't believe it puts them at a disadvantage. This doesn't mean that all lobbying is bad or bribery and it should be banned in every form, but I do believe there should be massive restrictions in place. 
And greater concern too should be given to these conflicts of interest, like with coal and mansion. It should be transparent who's paying who and why. Whether you consider lobbying an important tool or nothing but a bribe, I believe it needs more restrictions all the same. Cinema and Mansion have both seemed to change their tune when money is involved. I don't know how they'd vote if money were not in the picture, but it's disheartening to see to their supporters, primarily those who actually believed in cinema, left out in the cold wondering what happened. No matter how you feel about cinema or mansion, I can understand why there would be disappointment from someone who voted for a candidate they believed in and only for that candidate to start voting in the complete opposite way they claimed. Maybe cinema was trying to be more centrist and this was going to hurt her later. Maybe mansion is doing the same. I'm curious about your opinions. What do you think of these supposed dinos? But with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure you go to my Linktree link. It contains all of my social media, other channels and projects that I'm involved in. So thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.